you can't think of the moment and all that stuff. You have to just be excited that you're a person that created that moment in your life. Mm. You were able to get to a, a, a place where you had the chance to have a moment like that. So you've already done, you've already done something great, even if you fail. Kelly, welcome to the uh, to the Golfer's Journal office. I appreciate you doing this. All right. um, I, I'm fully aware that you do not like cross sport comparisons, but it's not every day I sort of get to talk to greatness. So I'm just going to go for it off the top. You're aware of that? I'm not really aware of that. That's I don't like every every single writer that talks to you s finds somewhere in the in the story to write. Kelly does not like cross sport comparisons. Really? Yeah. No, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that you can exactly compare athletes but i i don't mind cross sport comparison yeah I, well i don't think it's productive in in terms of like who's who's the greatest of all time yeah you know across a, there's yeah. no way to do that but i do think there are some similarities when you look at who others um sort of position as the greatest in the thing that they've done right and and <clears throat> somewhere along the way there's always you know they are propelled by some form of adversity right? Like Brady gets picked in the sixth round, MJ gets cut from the high school team. There's always the thing that takes them from good to great. So I'm mm. curious what, what you think those things were in your life that propelled you to greatness. Mm. I think before that happens, there's something mentally or emotionally implanted already from, <clears throat> from your life, from family or the way you grow up or siblings or all those sort of things, you know? I've, anytime I've been kind of pushed on that, I've always said that I think it was a, my recipe was uh, for better, for worse, or just a, a lot of different things that, that happened in my life that caused me to be super competitive and um, really driven. And, um, you know, it didn't hurt that I had a, a brother that was three years older, so I was hung out with the older guys. So I, my level had to kind of push to them, whether it was playing basketball or football or surfing, or, you know, whatever it was, skating. So <clears throat> I was always um, trying to kind of keep up with the older guys. And um, I, I mean, if, if you break it down, there's like mental and emotional things too, you know, with family. I mean, I've come from a broken home. I, Parents didn't have a great relationship. We didn't have much money, those kind of things. And, and all those were drivers for me to, to go out and try to make something of myself. And, um, <clears throat> um, and I think luckily I found something I really loved at an early age. You know, by the time I was eight years old, nine years old, I knew I was, I mean, I started surfing a little younger than that, but then I started competing at about eight or nine years old and I really liked it, really enjoyed it. Cause I, I played football, played baseball, basketball, the, all the different sports. Um, not so much in school, but you know, in leagues outside of school. <clears throat> and um, I enjoyed them and I was, I was relatively good at um, football and baseball. I understood the game really good. Basketball, not so much, um, but, but I was such a fan of those sports growing up that I could really read the plays in the field and, and understood how to like, tap into that. But surfing for me was just something different because it was so individual and it was all, everything out there was based on my decisions. And so it was, it was really more of a solitary thing that I fell in love with early on. It, did it feel like something you could <clears throat> control? Like your, your, the outcomes in surfing? Yeah, I, I, with surfing I can control, to, to some extent I can control my outcomes. I always felt though that there was something before I even understood what spirituality was or anything, I felt like the ocean and I had a relationship. And if I wasn't paying attention to it or giving it, giving it my energy, even, when, even as a little kid, I remember going up to Maryland for Christmas one year, we spent like 10, 12 days up there seeing cousins. And I came back and, and uh, I remember going surfing and, and I was just totally out of sync with everything. And I, in my mind, the ocean was tell, teaching me a lesson. It was like, you haven't paid attention to me, you're not gonna get any. You know, so I just couldn't get a wave that I wanted or be in the right spot and kept getting caught by waves. And that was my, that was the earliest, uh, one of my earliest memories of like really having that uh, interaction with the ocean. Um, but I, I always felt like the ocean was sending me messages. Even, I remember being actually younger than that and with the waves coming 
in from the ocean, there would, there would also be a little waves going side to side near the beach. And I always thought it was friends of mine sending me messages from other beaches, like, like, a, like a smoke signal. And so I used to send them back messages saying like, stop, I'm trying to surf, you know, but I don't know. I just was in my own daydream out in the ocean. And, um, I, I think I was, it, I'm, I'm more of a, I, I guess I, I'm pretty methodical when it comes to competition and stuff, but as far as <clears throat> in my life, I think that my creative side is probably stronger than, than my planning side. And, uh, surfing is very creative, you know, and, it, I, I think competition gave me these kind of barriers to figure out how to package the thing, but just going surfing, I just felt really free and no one else was going to tell me how to do it. And I sat in my imagination a lot of times looking at waves and imagining how I'd ride them, how my body would feel when I'm riding waves, um, the positions I would get into and, and how to use all my muscles and, and everything right to interact with the board and the wave properly. So <clears throat> I kind of, I, I felt like I formulated my own way of surfing in some way. Do, have you ever put any thought to why it is that you can communicate with the ocean, this relationship? Because it, it seems like throughout your entire career, you know, sort of one of the, the thing, a hallmark of your career is like when you need a wave, you know, especially mm. late in contests time after time after time you're able to like somehow summon it yeah i did that a lot of, i did that a lot of times in my career why do you think that is how do you think um part of it's i mean uh, th there's obviously some kind of luck to it there's also there's there's obviously also some kind of like understanding i have of the ocean and uh, and of the situation and what's possible um you know probably the most obvious and and best one i've had in really long time, probably in the last decade, was at the Pipe Masters a year and a half ago, <clears throat> surfing in the um, third or fourth round with Baron. The round of 16, I think. Um, yeah, 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 round of 16. And, and um, yeah, this, and there was, there was like 45 seconds to go and he had me on the ropes and um, I knew I needed a really good wave. And with the amount of time looking at my watch, I'm like, okay, I got 45 seconds left, that means I had just gone over a wave that meant I could catch any of the next three waves because there's about that day there's about 14 seconds interval between the waves so I'm just doing the math in my head I'm like okay if, if, if it's it's not gonna be this next wave but I think it's the one behind but if not I have time to get out to the next one and um because it was this I think I ended up catching the second no I caught the third one but I had to I remember thinking I have to paddle out to it <clears throat> because I have to gain a couple of seconds. I'm only going to have like a second or two once I stand up if I was sitting right where I, I had been. So I paddled out about another probably 20 yards, 15, 20 yards to get to the wave. And when I stood up, there was about three seconds left. Um, and when that happened and I got the score and, and I, uh, at that point I went, okay, I'm going to win this contest. <laughs> I just, because I feel like almost every event I've ever won, there was some magic that happened during the event. Just something just clicked my way and my confidence just went through the roof. And at that point, I feel like I lose all fear of losing and it just becomes complete forward on the accelerator confidence. And, um, but I, I don't always have that when I surf. I just, sometimes I need something that breaks that, whether I get myself in a bad situation and I claw myself back into the heat or, I, you know, I get my back against the wall. Mm -hmm. It's, I, you know, I've also had, I've also had periods of time where I was just dominant from the beginning of the heat to the end, but, but my, if it weren't for all the wins I've had sort of last minute, I wouldn't have won nearly as much as I have, yeah. obviously, but, but those just last second heroics have at times propelled me into other events, you know, and maybe I'll win two or three in a row, whereas I could have just lost and had a ninth place or a 17th or a fifth. And then all of a sudden I go on a, a, you know, a two or three event win. So <clears throat> there's something that we're, you, you just have to unlock that confidence. And, and um, the, I find the further I get along in a contest too, uh, the, the less fear I surf with. Interesting. I mean, you said after that, um, that's that wave that you got at Pipeline uh, last year that <clears throat> it was, you know, you sort of had, had acknowledged, you're pretty emotional. You acknowledge like, I can't believe how many times this has happened in my career. Yeah. Um, but also that 
it could come as a product of just being in the ocean every day. Yeah. So is there a thought that, you know, like the work turns into luck somehow? Um, fun turns into luck at work, mm. <laughs> maybe. Um, yeah, you got to spend that time. When you spend the time, you start to unlock all the little, um, the little secrets at different waves, you know, at Pipeline. It's not a big zone, but there are into out, right to left, there's, there's some secrets based on what the swell's doing, the interval in the waves, the size of each wave, the angle it's hitting the reef, all that kind of stuff. So unless you've spent years and years out there, it's, it's easy for someone who has spent that amount of time out there to kind of play it a bit different and play it better than you. And um, luckily, as far as the tour goes, there's only one or two other guys that are like even close for the amount of hours I've put in out there. But when I was, you know, in my late teens and through my 20s, I put more time than anybody in the world on, at a pipeline. I just, I wanted to know every little aspect of every face it had. <clears throat> it was such a, um, you know, we'll look at this picture on the wall. And, um, as a young kid, I was terrified of that. And now I look at this, this wave, this, this huge wave with a, you know, board going up the face and the guy obviously bailed his board. And that looks fun to me. That just looks like I can't wait. But as a little kid, I was like, oh my God, that would kill me. So there was this thing where I needed to understand that fear. I needed to put my time in out there and get, get familiar with the place. And is that, is that how you overcome fear? <clears throat> is just by putting yourself in it all the time? Yeah, I mean, if you're gonna stand on the sidelines of whatever that fear is, um, you know, it could be a little kid wanting to, you know, I remember being in junior, junior high school and I liked this girl and I was always too scared to kind of ask her out. You never know then, you know, you might as well go figure it out. <laughs> but um, surf wise, it, it was, uh, it, it was just kind of putting your toes in the water, getting out there and, and getting closer and closer to the waves until eventually you're taking off and then you're getting bigger waves. And I used to make goals for myself every year when I went to Hawaii, you know, I want to surf waves that are, you know, a couple feet bigger every year from the time I was about 14 years old. And then I thought, okay, by the time I'm 20, I'll be surfing anything. And so that was really kind of the goal for me and getting, just getting comfortable in the water, putting yourself in bad situations and realizing they're not usually as bad as you think they're going to be. A lot of, a lot of the uh, worst things that happen happen in smaller waves. You know, people hit their heads and get cut and injured and even drownings. Um, you know, you're not immune to it because the waves are one to two foot. You can hit your head on the board or the bottom. So... <clears throat> Usually big waves are not as bad as you think it's going to be in your head. But that also means that there's like always danger, you know, present. Small wave, big wave. Uh, oh, yeah. Do you, do you, is fear ever present like even today when you go out and surf? Yeah, I, fear is a good thing because it wakes you up and keeps you on your toes. I mean, sometimes after surfing somewhere for years and years, you might get a little bored with it and not as excited. So, you know, something just... Something kind of keeping you in check is good. Mm -hmm. It makes you be really present in the moment, keeps you really like feeling alive. I think that's what surfers love so much about chasing big waves and heavy waves is that, you know, that feeling, that feeling of that fear, that danger is, it's, um, it's so exciting. You're doing something maybe no one's ever done before, ever, you know, in the history of the universe or whatever. That's, I like to think about it like that. Like I watch guy, all my friends surfing, the biggest waves in the world lately, the guys that are really chasing it and really after it and, you know, wanting to surf a hundred foot wave. Those guys are doing stuff that's never been done before. And that's pretty cool. You know, that's, there's, there's, you, when it's just sitting there waiting to be done, it just depends on yourself and how far you can push it. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if guys in basketball think about that. Mm. Um, maybe guys racing cars do in skiing and snowboarding, you know, first descents and stuff like that. That's kind of in that same realm, I guess. Um, the unknown, uh, I got a friend who makes movies about great whites and different scary animals. And, uh, he was saying that his biggest fear was great whites. So he started making movies about it and he, it, he realized that, that, ex that being around them made him feel totally scared, but also like really present really, really like with himself and with the people around him. And he said it became really good for him and his family, like with his kids, he's more present with them, but he needed to kind of understand the fear first. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's kind of like a, I think exposure sort of therapy is a, <clears throat> like a, a technique that's been used in, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy for a while. It's yeah. like if you're scared of knives, here's a knife, look at the knife. Yeah, yeah. Touch or an ice bath, it. just jump yeah. in an ice or bath, an ice you'll bath. be alive yeah. right now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so if you're scared of big waves, you just gotta go seek big waves, I guess. Yeah, but you, you know, not in a dumb way, you don't just jump in like, sure. oh, I'm gonna surf a big wave. Like, you know, I just started surfing, I wanna do something that scares me, I mean, if you just started surfing, anything should scare you. Yeah. You know, you're unfamiliar with what's out there. That's one thing a lot of people will say, oh, I couldn't surf, I'm too scared of sharks, I don't know what's in the ocean. But that just holds you back from doing something you, you love. And, uh, but yeah, big waves, I think you, you just have to work your way up to it. And I think that you're, I think people need to assess their skill level and match, They'd be able to understand what their skill level is and how they can match that to the type of surf they're riding. You, see, you do see a lot of people who really don't know what they're doing to get themselves way over their head. And maybe they can hold their breath for a long time, but it doesn't mean that they understand how to ride those waves. Sure. You know? So that could, fear button is good. Fear is good. Um, you mentioned it uh, just a moment ago, but the idea of being present, I've always, because <clears throat> I do not surf uh, and have never surfed, hmm. the the, yeah, uh, <laughs> the um, that moment, like when you when you do catch the wave that you need the most, and you stand up on the board, seems like such a fleeting moment to me. Where, you know, even great rounds that we remember in golf, Tiger at you know in 2019, that's a five and a half hour round where you're in it, yeah. right? What is that? What what does it take to? Okay, now you've got the wave that you needed to get, and now you have to perform. How do you toggle? What is that? Is there a switch that occurs between? You can't think of all that. You can't think of the moment and all that stuff. You have to just be excited that you're a person that created that moment in your life. Hmm. You were able to get to a, a, a place where you had the chance to have a moment like that. So you've already done, you've already done something great, even if you fail. Um, but the, the, the idea that you can cut all the noise out, just get rid of all the white noise and just focus on the task at hand. You know, for us, it's we have a wave and the wave will offer you a certain thing you can do on it. And um, if you can match your skill to what the wave is, is uh, offering you and the wave's good enough to get your score, then you, you know, that, that moment might happen. But yeah, it's, um, and my, my mom used to occasionally come to events um, and she would, if I was losing, she would leave the area and not watch. And then I would come back and I'd win my heat. And she'd be like, you know, you were losing when I was watching, so I left. So she, she built in it to her mind that it was because she was disappearing, like somehow she was controlling it. But I, I think it goes a little bit, maybe, <clears throat> maybe almost deeper than that in a way, because as a kid, um, I was always late to school. <laughs> I'm still late to everything, but as a kid, my, like my mom would somehow, sometimes, you know, jump in the car. Okay, we got to go. We're late to school, and then the car wouldn't start, and I'd be late, way late to school. And uh, I feel like we were always like slightly unprepared at my house, and uh, we didn't really plan things out that well. But um, when I compete, it just forces me to. It, it gives you these barriers, and and you know what you have to do within that or you have an idea of what you have to do based on what the other guy's gonna do. And um, if, you're, if you're educated enough about what's possible in surfing, where the other person's level they're at, what their, what their strengths are and weaknesses and what your strengths and weaknesses are, you can kind of put that whole equation together and, and work it out. And, and the best times are when it comes down to that last wave, the heat's ending for either guy. You know, it's really exciting when that, when that happens. And, um, and, you know, I've been on the receiving end either way, getting the score or having someone else get the score. And, you know, it sucks when it goes against you, but those also fuel the fire. <clears throat> I had a heat in um, 2008. I was in Indonesia at Uluwatu. We had an event and I was surfing against someone who, um, on paper, wouldn't beat me in those conditions usually. And uh, with about less than two minutes left, I had priority. I was winning the heat. A good set of waves is coming. And all I had to do was pick the good wave that was coming. 
and something just came over my mind. I, got, I just started thinking about the situation. Like I wasn't just present, I was like actually just in my head thinking. And something, I remember this thought coming to my head going, you're gonna make the wrong decision. And I was like, oh shit. Okay, now make the other decision. Make the one you weren't gonna make. And so I got in this like, I got it totally in this like weirdest headspace. And um, just to also set the situation, I had already won like, I think like four of six events that year. Like I was almost gonna seal the world title if I won this contest. And this, this first, the first wave of the set was coming and I looked at it and went, that's not the right wave. Like that's, that's not the wave that's gonna give him the score to beat me. And so I shouldn't go, but he paddled. And then I was so in my head, I was like, well, I wasn't gonna go on this wave, but I told myself I should do what I wasn't gonna do. So then I went and then I fell. And then he caught the next wave and he, I remember him getting spit out of the barrel right past me. And um, two things, if, if I didn't take that wave or if I had made my wave even, I, I might have still won the heat, but he got like a nine point ride on the next wave and, and uh, the crowd went kind of crazy. I remember like the whole thing like in slow motion. And I was thinking, <clears throat> you know, like it sucks to be on the uh, losing end of something like that. But at the same time, it, it some, sometimes takes a little while to brush those losses off. But I remember the next morning I went surfing and as I, as I went to surf, all the guys that were chasing me on the tour at that time, um, they were all surfing the next morning and they all had heats that were favorable for them. So I thought, okay, they're all going to make up some ground on me. And all four of those guys lost in three of the four lost in the next round and one guy lost in the round after. But I remember going surfing that morning, hitting the water and going, you know, it's not going to help me to like sit here and dwell on this too much. Um, the good thing about it was that I felt I really truly felt that the heat was gonna, like something was gonna happen. Yeah. I felt like it was gonna be negative, but I felt it so strong. I thought, well, that still tells me I'm really connected. Even though I, I didn't make the right decision, I still felt the thing, you know? So surfing is a lot of feel and you have to trust that sometimes against your better instincts in your mind or your better choices. Sometimes you just gotta trust that feel and. Um, I try to do that a lot when I paddle for waves. I'll just think, does this feel like the right wave? Does it feel like there's a better wave behind? Or does this feel like one that'd be fun to ride? Even if it's just a normal surf, just, just to get back in touch with yourself. And, um, and if I trust that feeling, I always feel like I'm happier. Do you carry that over into life? Do you, do you work on <clears> being <throat> a present person? Yeah, I try to, yeah. It's, um, it's easier for me to do that in, in, the, in the ocean because it's so active and moving and you're not thinking so much. You just, you're just acting on what you're seeing. Um, and so I try to take that sort of as a mantra into real life, but you know, it's, it is easier for me in the ocean. Why is it more difficult? Um, or what sorts of things, maybe it's a question, do you do, you do to work on presence and away from the ocean? <clears throat> um, I'm an overanalyzer, like an overthinker. I've always been like a perfectionist. Same. Um, so I, I get in my head a lot. So if I can, if I can do things that kind of get me out of my head and just get me moving and active, uh, you know, working out, or we mentioned ice baths before, heat and ice baths are, I think it's great for everybody. You know, it's, I mean, health benefits are awesome, but when you jump in the cold, you're not thinking about your problems, you're thinking about <laughs> It's cold. just the physical feeling right then. Yeah. And then it, you, when you get out, you have all these endorphins and, you know, chemically it helps you a lot. So. You, you've been healthy for a long time. Like uh, the, to surf it, to compete at <clears throat> the level that you have for a long time. Mm. Uh, I imagine takes a, a tremendous amount of work. What, um, what have you, did you figure out something that others haven't, or is it consistency? What do you think has allowed you to compete to the um, level that you want for 40 years now? Yeah, yeah, it has been, it's been, I've been competing for 43 years now, it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, um, well, as I, I just, I love surfing as much as anybody in the world, probably. I just love to surf. <clears throat> um, as a kid, that was just the driving force. And then it became really like infectious to win contests. It was very exciting. So there was always that drive and that draw for me. 
Um, but as I turned pro and I wanted to have a long career, I really got into diet and understanding board design. And um, I mean, there's so many things that go into uh, in, into the final product. <clears throat> it's it's your thought process. It's growing as an individual and a person, being more being aware of the world around you um, and, and other people. Um, just trying to be tuned in at all times to, to different things, whether it's people or waves or travel or, I don't know, I have a lot of interest outside of surfing too. I do a lot of reading and I like to play music and golf obviously and um, jujitsu. And, but I, I love physical things. Um, <clears throat> um, I do read at night. I kind of read online and stuff, but I don't read books. I, I got into reading books for a while. I really loved it, but I just haven't done it for a long time. What do you read now? Oh, for some reason. Oh, I don't know, just anything I'm interested in. I just, random topics. A lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of stuff about cooking, actually. I love cooking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Strangely enough, my girlfriend and I cook like three times a day, so. Um, but I, I read about places I go, travel to, things I should do when I'm there, place mm -hmm. I need to see. Um, um, I don't know, various topics. How has your diet uh, evolved over this time? I know there's always new theories sort of yeah. being pushed. Um, where's, where's yours at currently? How has it evolved? Um, I'm not super strict. I'm not super disciplined. I just try to cut out the sugars. Um, you know, in the past year, I've really tried to cut out all the oils, seed oils, the sugar, and the carbohydrates. I just don't eat a lot of bread. And I love bread, but I don't, I don't eat a lot of it now. Um, corn chips, I used to be super addicted to corn chips. How could you not? Yeah, so many. yeah exactly. <laughs> um, but I was actually allergic to corn and I was getting like asthma from it. So I had to cut that out for a while, for a few years. Um, but yeah, sometimes I get really uh, super into my diet and uh, now I've kind of probably settled into this. I just try to eat as much unprocessed food as I can. Just try to cut out all the snack foods. And if they, if I'm snacking on stuff, it's usually just like some nuts or fruit, um, something healthy. Would you claim that you are not disciplined, or is that just in as it relates to diet? Um, no, as it relates to diet. I mean, I get I get much more disciplined at sometimes, but overall, I've been. I would say I've probably been as disciplined as most people for 30 years now. <laughs> I would say more. Probably. Yeah, yeah, probably. So, it, so it, you're saying it, it sort of, it yeah, like it flows it, as it. My my bad's not terrible, but my good is sort of extremely good. How bad will you let it get? Like, what's it? What's a bad? Oh, I you know go to Florida and I'll just eat a bunch of fried food. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Last year I put on about like 10, 12 extra pounds, which I've never done. So I went, I said, then I did like a five day water fast and then went keto for like three months and I lost the weight. I, I actually lost like, I think I got, I think I lost ultimately like 17 pounds, which is like, I don't have a lot of weight on me, you know, but I was just trying to trim down. I was trying to get back under 160, which I haven't done since I was probably in my twenties. I've always been like low, low one, low to mid 160s for a long time. But I got back to like 161 from like upper 170s, which is, that's pretty big for me. Is it, <clears throat> is it contests that help you like flip flip back into discipline mode? Yeah, I think so. It's, that's that's definitely part of it. Because then there's a goal. You know, you you have this this date and this place and time that you you have to you know you want to be at a certain size. Yeah. Not like a not unlike a fighter. Mm -hmm. You know, I watch a lot of MMA, and their discipline is incredible. Like doing six week camps leading up to fights. It's it's a little harder for us to do that. We can do that kind of leading into the first event of the year, but then you're just on the road, on the road. So you got to try to keep track of your diet and your sleep cycles and your boards and you're surfing enough and all that stuff. And also having a little time to have fun with your friends and all that. So <clears throat> being disciplined all this time has been great. I mean, for my career, it's been wonderful, but sometimes it's driven me a little bit mad. You know, sometimes I just want to break from it all. Yeah. But it's... uh. It's kept me healthy and fit. And you know, you mentioned before something about, um, well, it's something that was making me think about how I haven't really suffered from injuries. 
I've been pretty lucky. I've only ever missed a few events from injury in 30 years of being a professional. So um, I've had four broken feet, broke my ribs three times and various cuts here and there, but I've never had like an, I've only had one injury that put me out for like a long period of time. That was my foot six years ago. I broke really bad. And um, I struggled with that for about a year and a half, but that was when I was 45 years old already. So pretty much had 27 years of being a professional without a major injury. Which is insane. Yeah, yeah, so yeah like a little bit of luck there. For this sure. is the Joe Rogan foot. <laughs> Joe Rogan foot, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Everyone's saying the broken, that x-ray was yeah, was tough. Did. You mentioned that uh, winning winning was infectious and it's sort of like a, a bug that you caught. You, you know, surfing starts as this love <clears throat> for the act and then yeah. now it's compounded by this, um, you know, love to win and compete. I'd like to ask you about, a, you know, sort of a different motivator throughout your career, which is uh, rivalries. Mm -hmm. How much did rivalries play a part um, in the middle of your career as far as um, just pushing you to levels that maybe you didn't know you had? Yeah, everyone needs a rival to push and, and get that focus. You need someone. It's, I think it's good to have um, rivals that you're friends with and rivals that you hate. Like Both of them are good for sport. Um, as a kid... Growing up in all the local events, I definitely had a couple rivals. Um, you know, my local rivals in Florida were like all good friends of mine, Alex Cox, David Spear, um, Danny Mojado, and the four of us pretty much like ruled our division all those years. And then it would go into like regional, East Coast, international, uh, national, you know, national titles, US titles, and then internationally. And so I, I feel like I had different rivals at each stages of those. Um, you know, each year at our East Coast Surfing Championships, that was a big event for us. Mm -hmm. It's not as big of a, that's not as big of an event for the West Coast, but the East Coast because there's so many states and so many different surf cultures. Um, you know, you don't really hear about pro surfers from Washington and Oregon, and generally no one north of like maybe San Francisco. So it's basically like central Southern California. <clears throat> but on the East Coast, there's all these pockets of really good surfers all up and down the coast. And so that was a really big event for us. So each year there was like, okay, there's so-and-so. You know, I remember the one year there was a kid named Damian Bibbick who flew from Australia, moved to the East Coast to surf in that East Coast championships. And he was pegged to win the thing and I beat him. And that was like, I actually remember going to that event. I think I was like 13, 13 or so. and. I remember my dad met this kid Damien's dad and he was telling my dad that he didn't know who my dad was. They were just talking on the beach and he goes, all right, yeah, my, my, my son's going to win this contest and he's going to win the U.S. championships and then he's going to win the worlds and all this stuff. And my dad's like, ah, oh, cool. All right. He must be pretty good, you know? And my dad wasn't the kind of dad to brag about me at all. He just like played dumb with the guy, but not, not to be like underhanded or anything. He just like, oh, that's cool. Great. I hope your son does well. And then uh, I got first and he got second and then he realized who my dad was. And he's like, oh, you didn't tell me who your son was. He's like, well, yeah, I don't know. Just, you know, somebody's going to win. Mm -hmm. My dad didn't talk much about that kind of stuff. But there was always this, there, I remember there, there was a kid from Florida named Jimmy Parker when I was young who was, he was pegged to win the thing. And I, he got, I got first and he got second. And each year there was somebody who I had this big goal to try and beat. Um, the first year it was my best buddy, David Spear. I mentioned before and actually in the finals I got one wave that won it for me but that wave David I didn't even look but David and I paddled together and he stood up behind me and I dropped in on him and he kicked out for me because he's my buddy you know mm -hmm. but I never saw him and he told me afterwards oh you dropped in on me but I just kicked out so he didn't get interference and then he got second he should have beat me um but yeah, that was a that was a huge goal for me was that event as an amateur it was like something I wanted to do every year and I won it six years in a row and then Dave actually was the one to finally beat me when I was 16 or 17. He beat me and took the throne from me. But uh, I turned pro not long after that. And um, and then, you know, from there it was different challenges. There was the U.S. titles, there was the Worlds, and then turning pro. And at each stage, there was somebody that was like my rival. Um, <clears throat> as a late teen, it was Chris Brown, who was a close friend. He's from Santa Barbara. And, 
He was probably the best American surfer at that time, around the late 80s. Um, for the young guys, he was the best. And then when I went pro, there was like Shane Beshin, who we, we carried that over from amateur days. Shane and I were buddies as, kid, as, as young kids and then kind of became rivals and didn't really like each other much when we turned pro. Now we're good friends again. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was, you know, Rob Machado and I, Sonny Garcia. Um, and then my big rival was Andy Irons. And um, that went on for a number of years. And Andy and I really just didn't like each other at all. Like we were very polar opposite personalities. Um, <clears throat> I kind of always traveled by myself and he usually had a big crew and he was really in your face and I was a little more like reserved. It was just like everything couldn't have been more different between us. Um, but, you know, ultimately I think no matter who those rivals are, they, they ultimately become friends at some point. And that happened for Andy and I. Were there times in that rivalry that it felt... Uh not productive or sort of <clears throat> detrimental to performance? Like, did it, does it ever cross a line to, now I'm not focusing on sort of my mission at hand here, I'm focusing on? Uh, for me, it didn't. It just made me more focused. I just knew I had to be better. I had to be stronger, better cardio, trained up more, more creative in the way I surfed, get my boards together, make sure my body's in shape and my diet's right. Like, it, it really was like encompassing all that stuff for me. And, um, in the moment, it feels like you kind of hate that person. But at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, you, you got to thank that person for making you dig deeper and look at who you are and why and, and make you question yourself. You know, you need somebody to make you question yourself. And that can either be a really good friend who calls you out on your shit or it can be somebody who's challenging you to be the best you can be and you think they might be better than you. So, Is there ever a time that you had to conjure up a rival in your mind? to get you going? Yeah, um, I would create problems in my mind with people. Like I would sort of imagine I had beef with somebody because it would just get me so like in the moment and present to beat them. And they, they would have no idea. I would just kind of make something up in my head sometimes. <laughs> but this happened a lot when I was in my early 20s. Yeah. Yeah. It seems um, to be a theme of, of really great performers <laughs> where, you know, if you have nothing sort of pushing you, you just kind of <clears throat> make one up and, yeah. and go for it. Yeah, I might even just take something they said to me at some point, just twist it into something in my head. And then it would drive me to just be like in top performance in that heat or whatever. And I would never mention anything or say anything about that, you know, um, to the person or whatever, or to the media. But it was, it was just like, you need this fuel sometimes. You need a little bit of air, extra kerosene or something to kind of stimulate all your brain cells. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so one thing I'm I'm curious about is a sort of a outside looking in of the surf world are these extremely long wait times between performing. Yeah. Um. Sometimes what for eight days, a, a week. Nine days is the longest one I remember. Nine I think days. that happened twice. Yeah. How how is it? What are you doing in that time to stay to not I guess drive yourself mad? And is was golf ever a part of that? Yeah, so I mean, for people who don't know, we have a waiting period that's somewhere between 10 and 14 days for every event. And uh, we can, because it takes us three or four days to run the event, we got to try and plan out what that forecast is based on the, you know, all the criteria, all the you know, swell size, wind, et cetera, all the conditions. And it's not too hard to tell, generally speaking, but. Um, when I first got on tour, the old school days used to be, you started on Monday and you finished on Sunday and they'd run every day. But there was also a trials that fed into the main event. So the you know first like four days would be just the trials. <clears throat> and, um, but now we've gotten a, a little bit, uh, well, it's, we're probably pretty lucky that we have that option because sometimes condos would be running terrible surf. Mm -hmm. And back in the day they would be. Um, but we had an event in Spain. We were surfing this place called Mundaka. And Mundaka is very tidal. You can really only run on a, on a great day. You can only run for about three to four hours of surfing on the low tides. High tide gets too full. Too much water's moving from the river that comes out and stuff. And um, if, it's, you know, if the waves aren't b really big, they don't even break at a high tide at all. <clears throat> so we had this event and they started on day one and Generally what happens, we run three, three man heats 
And the first guy will move, he'll skip around. When we ran there to save time, whoever got third in that first round would just be out of the contest. So a friend of mine was in the first heat on the first day, they ran the first heat and he lost and the tide got too high and they called the contest off. They didn't have another heat for nine days. And he was home in Florida for seven days before the next person lost. And it was so weird to think <clears throat> that, a, that an event could be run that way. Yeah, I, I, It'd be hard if you were a golfer to think, I'm gonna go somewhere for how long and get paid how much? You know, because- You could totally like, transform your swing in those nine days. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you could go through a slump and come back out of it before the thing's running again. Or you could, you know, be playing great in the first round and shoot 60 and then shoot a 78 in the second round because you lost your swing or something. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just a, it, for us, it's, it's great because we're trying to maximize those conditions and get good, fair conditions. If you just had to go out and surf every day, it could be onshore and choppy, terrible, small, inconsistent. Um, you know, some days if we have a really small swell with a long interval between the waves, there'll be a long time between sets and there might only be one, one or two good waves in a whole heat. And if somebody gets those two waves, you have no chance. So we've maximized this way to run events and, and spoil us a little bit with try to get the best conditions, but it, it can still, you can get somewhere that could be in a bad wind pattern or swell pattern and not get those waves and you'll just have to end up running in something not very good. Uh, <clears throat> So what I do can't you, imagine. I can't imagine that in golf. No, it'd what, be so funny. You go to Augusta, and you're like, "Well, we're going to run sometime in the next two weeks, for four days." Yeah, because it's such a feel based. You know, the, the feels of golf day to day are sort of everything, right? Yeah. Like, through you could you could catch a feel on day one or Tuesday practice round. Yeah. And you just want to go play. That's why rain delays really suck too, because maybe your your body's warmed up in a certain way, or the club yeah. the club just feels good in your hands today, and you don't want any breaks in the action. Slow play sucks, rain delays suck. Yeah. You want this sort of really continual pace. I've played Pebble and Dunhill. So I know slow. rain delays and yeah. wind delays. Yeah. And, yeah. And just slow. The one year, one year I played Pebble and my pro and I started on we started on ten. And uh, at Spyglass. No, at, at uh sorry, MPCC. Yeah. And um and so our our eighteenth hole is a par three and uh, hole nine, we finished 17 holes and they called for a rain delay. So we had one hole to go the next morning at like 7 a.m. and it was pouring rain and I just didn't show up. My pro, <laughs> made, a, my pro made a birdie. My pro made birdie on the hole, so I was pretty happy. Yeah, I'm not showing up for that. Yeah. Um, so, but what are you doing? You have a nine day break, seven day break in between surfs. What do you yeah, do? Uh, if the waves are bad, I'm generally playing golf. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, a lot of golf in between. I've played golf. I've played a full round of golf in between heats on the same day before. Where was that? In Hawaii. You remember the course? Yeah, Turtle Bay. Okay. So I lost my heat. I surfed the heat in the morning. It was in 1997. I was surfing against Johnny Boy Gomes, who ended up winning the contest. I surfed against him in the morning in the first round heat. And um, I lost, so I had to go surf in the second round. And... Uh, so I, in between my first heat, which was first thing in the morning, I went and played a whole round of golf, came back and surfed another heat in the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Did it help? Uh, no, I ended, up, I ended up losing in the third round to him, okay. the same guy, Johnny, who won the, heat, won the contest. When did, um, when did golf sort of come into your life? I started playing golf in 95. I just went to the golf course one day with a friend who wanted to talk about some investment stuff. And we went and played golf and didn't talk about investment came back to the golf course to talk the next day and we didn't talk again. We just played golf and I just felt, I, something about that day just clicked. I hit one or two nice shots that kind of went rough the center of the face and stripped the fairway and that addiction hit me, you know, it just caught me. I'd played golf a few times as a teenager and just didn't like it. And then, I don't know, something just happened differently. Within a week, I went and bought a set of clubs and I was just playing for probably the first three years I got into golf. I think I played every single day. Yeah. Somehow hit balls or something. Full on bug. Yeah. What, uh, what role does it sort of play in your golf now, uh, in your life now? Is it, um, a relaxation tool? Is it a meditative tool? Is it a, to fuel the competition when you're not competing elsewhere? Yeah. It's all sorts of things, you know, it's for me, it's going out with friends and 
it's also a way to get away from everybody. Um, I do play by myself quite a lot. Like when I'm in Florida, I play a lot of afternoons by myself. I just jump on my bike and I got my bike rigged up, rigged up with a, with a, uh, a little trailer that pulls my clubs and they let me take my bike on the course. So I go do that. And, um, but yeah, I, I actually, I base a lot of golf around what I'm doing in different places. I know when I go to South Africa, I'm going to play a lot of golf. I know when I'm in Australia, I play almost every day. Yeah. Um, in Hawaii, it's a couple, few times a week. So <clears throat> big part of my world at this point. I heard a rumor that you have uh, sets of clubs sprinkled throughout, throughout the world. Yeah, I got, I got quite a few sets around. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I got too many sets, but I basically, my old sets, I just leave in different places around the world so I don't have to carry them. Because I got to a point where I was traveling around the world with a big board bag, some kind of an instrument, a guitar, a ukulele, and a, a golf set, uh, you know, a bag, bag of clubs. That's a lot of crap to carry with you and fit in your rent a car, especially if your girlfriend comes and she's got her bags. Oh yeah, it's not happening. <laughs> yeah, and it's a lot of packing, a lot of, a lot of overweight fees. Um, but yeah, I've just kind of left golf clubs around the world over the years. What, I also heard that you were a fan of Mo Norman. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Yep. Uh, what, how did you come across Mo and what, uh, what mm. do you like about his, the philosophies that he was pushing? Yeah, I was a, I'm a huge Mo Norman fan. I mean, I've probably watched 90% of everything that's ever been filmed of the guy. Yeah. I've just gone down these rabbit holes for years and years now, for the past 15 years. But so the, 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 the first golf magazine I ever bought was a golf uh, digest they had done like a 30 page article on Mo and it was right when I started playing golf and I was like, why? Well, okay, this guy is, this guy seems incredible. And I had started to hear all these stories about him, but I was thinking I should try and play like he does cause he makes it look so simple. And, uh, I never, I didn't for years, probably about a dozen years later, I was just kind of at this slump where I just, I felt like I was at this ceiling where I couldn't get past in my golf swing. So, I started reading about Mo, and there was this, there was a couple of websites totally dedicated to his swing, his grip, his thought process, all these videos, him talking about the swing and how it's an arm swing, it's not a lower body swing, just all these different things he would talk about, and um, and then reading all the different stories about him, and I just thought, you know, what, I'm going to try this. And the first day, I, I went to the range and I practiced it, kind of got my hands up on the plane more, yep. and and quieted my hands down. And it was the first time I ever felt like I could feel where the face is at the top of my backswing. I could, I could feel it square to the line or not, you know? I could tell where I was, I could tell where my club was pointing and it, it just seemed to simplify it for me. So I really, for a few years, I played really strictly like that. Um, really exaggerated hands up rigid, on the plane. Yeah. Really like a rigid form of it, yeah. <clears throat> and um, I would say like a mellow form, it would, would probably be like Steve Stricker. Where he's Jason his, Day, yeah, sort of body, maybe Day. Body yeah, I mean Bryson, obviously. Yeah, is, is, is but he's more upright than Mo was. Yes, and, and a lot more powerful and driving with the lower body and that kind of thing. But um, yeah, I think the first day I played around with uh, with a single plane um, and ten finger grip too. I went the the whole hog. Like I'm, I've been ten finger grip now for like for probably fifteen years. Um, but the first day I think I made like four birdies in my round. I was like, oh, this works. I'll just stick with this. And then I dropped my handicap from, I was probably at about a five or seven and I dropped down to about a two pretty quickly from there. And, and then I felt like I could go out and even if I had a bad round, I yeah. still was going to shoot an okay score. I wasn't losing the ball, you know, my, with my traditional swing, I would just get the face shut so much and hit the ball so low. And, um, and I wasn't dropping the, the club down and in. I was just kind of like whip hooking the ball a lot. I was just the way I was getting the, the club set at the top. Um, yeah, so it just simplified the game for me. And then I've kind of come back to a version that's somewhere sort of in between a traditional, it's just a more relaxed single plane, I guess. It's it, not really extremely like reverse a modified wrist. Version. Yeah, it's like a modified, yeah. modified. Wrist. It's so not the, the, the style that I would think just a, a <clears throat> an artist, you know, somebody whose whose profession is so based in feel and, you know, 
creativity and stuff mm. would would be attractive for. But I I also like as I watch videos of Mo, I think he was an artist. You know, well, he was. It's he true. was so unique. He talked. He was not scared to offend anyone. Mm -hmm. He wasn't worried about what the people thought about him or about his swing. He just knows. I can line up 10 golf balls and I can hit a pole out there 250 yards probably twice in those 10 balls. That was his mindset. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember him, I think he challenged Dave Pels. He goes, you can putt a 50 foot putt and I'll hit a 250 yard uh, drive and we'll see, who, I'll hit the pole before you can make a 50, yard putt, uh, 50 foot putt. And Pels did, said, I was sure he'd beat me. Yeah. Um, but all these weird stories I'd hear about him. You know, I heard this story, he was playing in Florida, he was playing with a Canadian pro, and he asked the pro, he goes, how far is this hole? He goes, I don't know, Mo, Mo it's like a driver nine iron. So he, Mo hits a nine iron off the tee and hits a driver to three feet and makes the putt, <laughs> plays the hole backwards. So I'm playing Sherwood one time and I'm, I'm paired up with this, I'm with a buddy and then we're paired with this Canadian pro. I go, do you ever know Mo Norman? He goes, oh yeah, I played some golf with him. I was like, oh, I heard this story about him playing golf and he, this guy told me, he goes, that was me. He goes, no I, he goes, I told him it was driver nine iron. He goes, sure enough, he hit nine iron off the tee, had like 240 yards into the hole, hit driver off the ground to like three feet and made the putt. He goes, he would do stuff like that all the time. He goes, there's no exaggeration to these stories. And um, so we can, <clears throat> we can confirm that one. That we can confirm that one, yeah. And uh, I don't know, I just, I, I'm sure that with anybody, with any story, there's a little exaggeration to it. And there's probably that with some of the stories, but when you listen to him talk and hit, and you watch him hit balls and you see the ball flight and you hear the sound coming off the club, it was just, it was so enjoyable to see somebody like that. And although I never met Mo, met Mo he played in Central Florida like six months a year. And he played with some people that I know. Um, he played at the local college, Brevard Community College. And uh, so I, I, I guess because I, that was my first golf magazine I ever bought. And because he was in my hometown for a lot of those years, I felt some sort of kinship with him because he saw the swing differently. And I always felt like I saw surfing differently. So I, I was related to him. And um, yeah, I think there's some part of his mind that was so obsessive and so in love with golf. And that's the way I've always been with surfing. So I, I really kind of have always gravitated to anything Mo Norman I love because it's just so quirky and interesting. Yeah, who would have thought? Kelly Slater, Mo Norman, spirit animals. Yeah, he's my, he's my golf spirit animal. Yeah. Where are the places when um, you're traveling around the world that you circle in the calendar? Like, I can't wait to play golf here. Yeah. Um, I love playing in Hawaii. I, I play Turtle Bay a lot. I, I go outer island sometimes and I, I go over to McKenna and play. I go to Lanai once in a while and play. I go to Big Island and play at like Kukio or Hualalai. Mm -hmm. Um, and some of the other courses there, but um, definitely North Shore, Turtle Bay. Anytime it's windy or the waves are no good, we're just a bunch of guys. All the, our collective group is called the Golf Geeks. Check us out on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> I don't run the account, but my friend, my Aussie friends do. Uh, yeah, the Golf Geeks. And um, so we just like, you know, there'll be texts like Golf Geeks today. And my, my Aussie friends especially, they want to get out and play 54 holes in a day or more. Um, and uh, Australia on the Gold Coast, I play a lot. I just play a local Muni course, Tweed Heads mostly. Um, but down at Bells Beach, there'll be a lot of lay days when we play the Sands or 13th Beach. Um, occasionally, if we're lucky, get into Royal Melbourne. Um, in South Africa, I play a Jack Nicholas course, the Cape St. Francis Lynx. Great course. One of my favorite courses around the world, actually. And we play out there almost daily. There'll be a lot of lay days at J-Bay mm -hmm. or, you know, bad wind or not enough swell. So we'll just go golf half the day. Um, also, lesser chance of getting attacked by a great white shark if you golf a lot there. <laughs> I've heard that's an issue. Yeah, we see sharks there a lot. Looking at Brendan. Yeah. <laughs> um, you have a question? Yeah. yeah. Um, Brad Faxon calls you a generational putter. How much... Uh, how much creativity is in putting? I don't know if he called me that. He just told me I putted really good. The question was Brad Faxon has, has called you a generational putter. No, I heard that, but yeah, I'm no, saying I don't I, know if I'm he's just ever, repeating it for them. No, I don't I don't know if he's ever if he's ever called me that. But, a, yeah, a, yeah, great yeah, putter, yeah. a great putter. He said me I said I putt really well after that. <laughs> How much is creativity versus uh, technical progress in that? Like um, can you 
Casey asked about creativity. And yeah. Humor. That's one area where creativity can really shine. Uh, yeah, I really feel, I really feel like putting, well, golf in general, it is that combination of, of creativity and, and technical, mm. um, blending those two things because obviously you want to get your technique right technique correct and and um you know to give you the best odds of of pulling off a shot but then you also want to have you want to see the possibilities and you know work a ball flight the what kind of a ball flight works with your swing and if you're behind some trees or you got to punch something underneath or you got to cut it or whatever, you know, it, the creative side of the swing, um, those are the shots that feel the best. But like, you need both. I, yeah, you need both. I, I mean, I prefer to go out and play boring golf. I want to go hit the ball up the fairway and hit greens. Um, that's the best. But my, the best shots I've ever hit have been because I put it somewhere terrible and I had to pull off a miracle. And, um, you know, it's like gambling. You always talk about the money you won. You don't tell him how much you spent the night before and you lost, you know, but you, if you pull off one miracle swing in a golf, in a, in a round of golf, you feel like you did something special, like something you haven't done before. I, I like that challenge of, you know, completely blowing a hole and making a great putt and walking off of the par. Um, it's like the, the opposite of playing a great hole and then three putting. Um, but I, I love the blend of putting the creative in with the technical. So I, I'm, I feel very technical when I set up to a shot and I'm, I'm getting my, my body and the, and the club, everything where I need to be. But then imagining the ball flight and, and picturing how the shot should work, it feels like the creative side to me. And I think there's a really good blend of that in golf. Um, you have to be imaginative. Sometimes you just got to take your medicine and punch the ball out. But other times, you know, if you pull something incredible off, it gets, it gets your round going. You know, it's almost like when, when I was telling you certain events, I feel like if something, if I can sort of pop the lid off of it by winning heat that I shouldn't be winning. Yeah. Same thing in golf. I feel like if you make some kind of great shot for me, I either like to, I like to get my bad hole out of the way early on. Like the, one of the best rounds I ever had, I shot 69 and I triple boogied the second hole. And from there on, I, I almost made a, a one on the third hole. I had six birdies coming in, didn't make any mistakes. But if I didn't triple the second hole, I probably would have shot like a 74 that day. Like I needed something to like get me focused. And um, I don't know, I, I, that's, the, that's the thing you love and hate about golf. I saw a post from this guy the other day and he was talking about, <clears throat> he was hung over. He was talking about how much he hates golf. And he was like, I was hung over, you know, on a good day, I'll shoot in the eighties. He's like, today I went out and shot like an 82 or an 84. He's like, I don't get it. I'm super hung over. I had no idea I was gonna play any good today. He goes, the other days I sleep early, I wake up early, I get, I'm totally prepared and I go out and I shoot like a 95 or a hundred. He's like, and he was screaming, I mean, he was just screaming at the camera and I was just thinking, everybody feels this way. Yeah. You know, Yes. everyone feels this way, no matter if you're, you know, one of the top guys in the world are just beginning. And it's, in fact, it's probably easier if you're just beginning because you, you know, you're like, oh, this thing's just super hard. But golf sometimes just doesn't make any sense. No. Yeah, I'm not playing anybody that's hung over. My buddies know. Like, you're, it's a recipe for them to just, yeah. just shoot yeah, you six, just don't seven think, under. Yeah, you you're just, just don't surviving. Think yeah. You know, that's what they say about uh, injured golfers as well. You know, but... As you, I, I had a I, I had a guy tell me he caddied for a, a pro I won't mention back in the seventies, maybe in the sixties or seventies. He just showed up this course to caddy for anyone. He picked up a round, and this is one of the all time great golfers showed up and he was still hammered, drunk, didn't sleep the night before, and went out and shot sixty two or sixty one. And he's like, he didn't even know who the guy was at the time. It was like he was just starting out, mm -hmm. and uh, but he was just like basically straight from the bar, stumbled on the course and shoots sixty one or sixty two. Yeah, but yeah, there's something to it where you, if your your mind gets in the way more than anything, you know, like if you miss a five foot putt you should have made, you struggle with that length the whole rest of the day, mm -hmm. and uh, then you start overthinking it and you're over reading it, and 
you know, maybe you're better off just being hung over. <laughs> Guess it's the takeaway. <laughs> you don't care. Uh, I shouldn't make it. Boom, it goes in the hole. When you see a pro make a 20 footer for par, <coughs> they've, they've hit it all over the yards on one. Yeah. And they make a 20 footer. It's yeah. like, uh oh, like, you know, that guy's off the races because he, yeah. he felt like he got hit in the face and he's survived. Yeah. You know, and now if I see a putt going on the first hole, something good is going to Yeah, happen. it's like that. I was the first time I, I, I've played a lot of golf with Sandy and Tommy Armour over the years. I used, Sandy kind of taught me how to play the game in the late 90s. And um, they invited me to come out to Vegas and play golf with them. It's the first time I've ever played with Tommy at the time. And uh, first hole, I hit a huge slice. Second, second shot, I hit a duck hook into like super thick grass. Fourth, uh, third shot, I whack it out and I'm about 40, 50 feet from the pin. I drain, a f I drain it for par. And I just look at him like, you guys just get ready. It's gonna be a long day. I'm gonna do this all day long. But I don't know, I, I probably shot 95 that day. But uh, that, that first hole, you know, you make a miracle shot and it makes you feel better. Yeah. It, it really is the blending of technical and creative though. You yeah. know, because it, you, you could say that that has been your whole career kind of in one, right? It's like this, on one side, this relentless will uh, and, and work to put yourself in the ocean, to overcome fear, to keep yourself healthy, to keep your mind sharp. And then when it's time to go, you have to be an artist. Mm -hmm. You have to be creative. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, I guess, the same sort of problem of golf is how do you be both of those? I think a lot mm -hmm. of people can be one, but being both is a whole different, Yeah, it's a whole different issue. Yeah, you, 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 have, to, you have to be both. I mean, see what Tiger did over the years so much creativity in what he did. And he was maximizing all the different skills in the game better than the next guy. Yeah. He was driving it further. He was hitting more greens. He was making putts he shouldn't. His short game was ridiculous. He had all the flop shots and everything with a wedge. And you just see when you put all those skills together at the level that Tiger did, there's no way he's not gonna win more than everybody. Yeah. And he had that, you could, I was, I was drafting off him a lot for those years, you know, watching him play and just getting inspired and like the imaginative thing that he had going on. I felt like I could relate to that and I could, I could put that into my surfing and try to make my, all the different aspects of my surfing good. Um, I think that was one thing that I really took away from his career as it was, as we were watching it in real time. I remember when he, uh, right when he turned pro, I think his first win and one of my pro friends goes, there's a new sheriff in town. And I was like, how exciting is this? You know, I'm just getting into golf, but like all of a sudden there's this guy who's just going to be like a world changing, world beating player. So <clears throat> I had just, luckily for me, I had just gotten into golf when Tiger turned pro like a couple years before. So I watched everything. I was just like, a, you know, a big fan, obviously. But, um, but he was inspiring you. Super inspiring to me. Yeah. Yeah, really inspiring to me. It was fun to watch. Yeah. What, are, are there any other athletes out there, like uh, uh, a Brady or somebody that has sort of pushed you to compete <clears throat> longer than you thought you might? Um, I don't know. I, I, maybe George Foreman, to be honest with you. Okay. You, when tell, I me, was, tell me about that. Well, I was like 18 or 19. He was in his 40s. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe when I was 20, something like that. And he was in his 40s fighting for world titles at that age, you know, against Evander Holyfield and Tyson and all them. And he seemed ancient, you know, and he was years younger than I am right now. But um, I remember thinking, how cool, this guy is just like still challenging the best in the world at a young man's sport at a, at a crazy um, level. And... Um, um, but I, you know, I grew up watching Tyson. I was a huge Tyson fan. That whole him and Holyfield era was super influential to me because that was he was already he was already already the world champ before I ever um, even turned pro. Um, in fact, on my 18th birthday, Tyson lost to Buster Douglas in Tokyo. It was my 18th birthday night, and I lost 17 games of ping pong to my best friend that night. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I don't know why that that night seemed like I think that night 
actually inspired my whole professional career. Um, I only bring that up because th that friend of mine was like my, he's like the fourth brother in my family. And um, he was better than me at most sports. And he used to just beat me at everything and make me cry. And he made me actually probably the competitor that I am. Um, but I remember years later, I beat him at ping pong. And I told him, like I said, just remember that night of, of Douglas was a night of, uh, the night that Buster Douglas beat Tyson was a huge night of upsets and you shouldn't have beat me like that. <laughs> <laughs> As another rival. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was like my, he was like my big rival forever, my buddy Drew. We would do everything, We'd, we competed at everything together. And I think he was the only person I knew that was more competitive than me and, and better at me than most things. So it was really like through my teenage years, through all through high school, he was just beating me at everything and just putting me in my place. And it made me just want to be better and better and better. Yeah. So it got me super focused. And he sometimes would call me during contests or whatever and just be like, just remember how bad I beat your ass and how bad it made you feel. Don't want to feel that way when you compete. And he's like, go kick everyone's ass. So Fantastic. Yeah. Is there, um, is there anything that you haven't <coughs> done that you would still like to do um, in, in the context of professional surfing? Is there anything you look back on that you wish you would have accomplished? Um, no, I can't really say there is. I mean, there's events I didn't win that I wish I had, but like, Oh, three, I've, I've won. Yeah. But I wouldn't change that because that helped me win. Oh, five, Oh, six, Oh, eight, 10 and 11, all those other years that, that year in Oh, three, I lost to Andy really closely. And that got me more focused and more driven. It took me about a year to get over that. And, um, but when I did, I was, I felt unbeatable, but it took me getting that, it, it took me having that low to get, to kind of reassess what I wanted to do. Cause in 2004, I remember just basically not really engaging with Andy. You I know, mean, I just like, frick, I got, I, I was in such a role and he beat me down the final stretch. And, um, when you're a, when you're a competitor like I am, that's like, it's a hard blow. I had never lost down the stretch, you know? And uh, um, and then the next year I didn't really engage. And then in 05, I remember when the season started, I saw Joel Parkinson at our awards ceremony. And I said, who's it gonna be this year, me or you? Cause one of us is gonna beat this guy. And I just, I wanted to get somebody else fired up, you know? So I could kind of feed off that too. And we could, we could have a little fun thing going on. And then, yeah, 2005 was when I just, I, I, I just thought, you know what? I spent 2004 not really putting myself out there and, and getting involved like I should, not focusing like I should, not wanting to be in that final crunch again and losing. And I thought, well, why am I even here if I'm not gonna try? And so 2005, I just got super focused again and I just, I just didn't think about the outcome. I just went, you know, I know what the prize is, I know what I want and I know how to get there. Mm. So it, it definitely reignited my flame. So why still compete now? Are you still as, as focused on uh, <clears throat> the process and the... Uh, Good question. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm like clearly not. But there's events I like to surf and there's events I like to win. Like Pipeline's always like a, a dangled carrot out there. Like if I could surf Pipeline forever, that's our Augusta. If I could just surf, the, surf that forever, then I would. Um, I, to be honest, the last probably three, four years has been just this idea of trying to get into the Olympics and I haven't really been focused on being at my top for that the whole year. Um, if the waves are bad, I kind of give a half ass effort. It's, I probably never thought I'd say that, but I also, I, I did make a, a plan where I wanted to surf until I just didn't want to do it anymore, compete. So when I'm done, I'll be done. I'll be like, I won't even look back. I might not even pay attention to contests anymore. Um, <clears throat> so I'm getting close. Let me win pipeline this year and I'm freaking out of there. <laughs> <laughs> so what is it about the Olympics? I don't know, the Olympics was never my goal because we didn't have it right. in surfing. Yeah. So it's only really become reality in the last few years. And then I just figured at the tail end of my career, it'd be a nice bookend if I could get in the Olympics, but I just, I've been 
slightly injured for the last couple of years and I haven't been motivated like I normally am. And you got to want it, you know, you got to like eat, sleep, wake up thinking about surfing or whatever it is you're doing in order to be the best. And, um, um, I don't know. I'm going through a, I would say I'm probably going through like a little bit of a withdrawal or like a, a, a tailing off of, um, kind of detoxing from competition. I like the idea, you know, I think the ultimate for me would be that I go out and compete and I don't, I truly don't care if I win or lose. If I lose, I'm just as happy as if I won and it, like no difference. Um, like there's some sort of spiritual thing in that for me. Um, it's not a reality yet. I still get pissed off when I lose, <laughs> but, um, and I know where my level is, you know, I know that like my air game's not up where the top guys are. Um, in fact, I've struggled to even do airs last couple of years because of my, my hip injury that I've had. Um, I walked around for about a year and a half just now, like hobbling with this, just thinking I'm gonna have to deal with this pain forever. And then I got a surgery like two and a half months ago. So we'll see when this all heals up, if I can kind of up that level and if I'm motivated this year or not. And if I'm not, I'll probably pull off the tour. And, um, but yeah, my, my uh, results have definitely suffered with all that. With des Desire is the biggest thing. Cause if you really want it, you can kind of push past the injuries with your adrenaline and stuff. Um, at least I think I can, but I haven't been sort of planning out my heats, free surfing enough, getting my equipment right, all the things that I feel like I had to jump on everyone else for years and years. I just don't do it the same way. And <clears throat> I'm actually fine with that, but, um, you know, cause that's just life, you know, at some point it, it, it's over, like things change and you move into the next stage of what your life's gonna be. And, um, uh, but I've, Early years on tour, I'd get out first thing in the morning. I'd be catching more waves and free surfs than everybody. Now, sometimes I don't even free surf at the breaks we go to because it's crowded and everyone's out there trying to battle with each other for that one hour you have before they run heats in the morning. And I just don't want to do it. Um, and then a lot of times, like we went to France the other year, my girlfriend and I, the last time we had a concert in France, I free surfed two times the whole two weeks we were there. I surfed my heats and I free surfed twice and that was it. Played a lot of golf. But, um, yeah, the, um, and, and like I said, I haven't had any major injuries other than the one, my foot a few years ago, but then last few years I've been in pain quite a lot with my back and my, my left hip. Yeah. So, and my foot still flares up like every single day. I'm still dealing with my foot after six years. It's, it was <clears throat> potentially, I mean, the, the, the doctors being nice to me and the, the physios and stuff, but you know, after digging in for a while and getting comfortable with the injury I had, they were saying this is like a career ending injury. So I've probably been lucky that I've been able to go past that. What do you, um, when you say detox, like once you, once you are fully detoxed, yeah. what do you imagine life looks like? Oh, uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm still going to chase waves around the world. You know, there's, a, there's a lot of places I love to go and I have good friends all over. In fact, I've been, I've been kind of like, um, I've been struggling with that a little bit because I got so many good friends all over the world and like little groups and pockets of communities I'm, I, I live within throughout the year. And part of that is based around the competition because I different place I go, whether it's France or Australia or um, Indonesia, wherever, like I have these groups of friends all over the world. And luckily, because the competition takes me to those places, I get to see them every year. And so that's going to change as I get off tour. And um, But maybe I'll have more time once in a while in those locations to kind of just interact and see my friends and see those communities. But I know some of, I know some of that life that I built up over the years is going to end. And that's kind of sad. You know, I'm, I've been doing it longer than anyone's ever done it. 30 years of being on tour. <clears throat> I think the next longest person is probably like 12 or 15 years, but it's become a life for me. And this is like my extended family all over the world. So I love it in that way. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask you one, one last thing about something you said before we get out of here? Um, <clears throat> you, there was an SI profile written about you last year, a really good one. And you said that you spend the first decade of your life learning and then the rest unlearning. Mm. What, um, 
what does that mean exactly? And what are you still unlearning and learning? Yeah, I think we're all still unlearning and learning our whole lives. You should be anyway. Um, I don't know, there's a, there's a saying, show me the boy at eight and I'll show you the man at 21 or whatever. It's, 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 I don't know if I got that exactly right, but that's the gist of it, is that as a kid, you learn all these things from your family and your friends and you kind of become generally the person you are. And then as you get older and you evolve, you try to keep the things that are good and throw the things out that are bad and, and, and learn them a different way. So I think that's basically what I was saying. You're just trying to, I don't know, we all learn some healthy and some unhealthy stuff. So that was more of like a spiritual kind of growth comment, I think. Um, and, and with this point in history, there's so much turmoil in the world. It's so hard. Like I've been really struggling to, to watch the news and listen to what's written online and, and then see two different people write about the same thing and you get completely different stories and it's all sensational bullshit. You know, everyone's just trying to like stamp their place in the world by making something stand out from something else. And unfortunately that's bad for humanity and that's, that's bad for our emotional wellness. Um, and then, you know, if you don't make a stance, they yell at you too. Um, if you do, you're wrong by it from half the people. So I don't know. It's, I love technology. I love, I, I love this period of time that I've been born in to go from, I was born in the early seventies and, um, you know, the, 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 all the music and the culture and the technology. And I grew up on the space coast. So I got to watch all the shuttles launch and be, feel like I was kind of part of this, the, the space program in Florida. It was a big part of our lives growing up and now SpaceX is there. And, um, but I, I think just seeing everything go from like analog to digital in our lifetimes and see now AI coming in and this, this incredible evolution of technology during this period of time, it's, it's just good and bad. I think it's, I think it's probably better overall for people to be, mm, not so exposed to everything in the world at once. I think it's better for culture. I think it's better for our um, emotional, emotional and mental health um, to be more concerned with and involved with the, with the people just close to us in our local environment as opposed to fighting with people about something that's going on the other side of the world that we actually don't really know what's going on. You know, there's so many layers to people and things and belief systems. Um, so, there's part of me that, that yearns for that, like when I was a kid period of time where I had to wait for a surf magazine to come out three months later to tell me what results happened in South Africa when the pros went there. Cause I didn't, I couldn't find out. I can't really call somebody and just ask them. And then, you know, having that access to all that information, for instance, in the surf world, somebody gets a crazy wave in Ireland a couple of days ago, you see it online that afternoon or within minutes. So we know it's like so exciting to watch. It just sucks you right in and you, you don't want to, you're, you're never going to say, no, I'm not going to see it. But at the same time, I think there's something good to your mind imagining what something is for, for a period of time. So you see it your own way instead of just having all the exposure to everything. Um, and for me with, with surfing, um, like central Florida, uh, when I was a kid, there was pockets of really great surfers around say the country and the world. And so like central Florida had a really good crew of guys that I grew up around. Um, and that was the, the bulk of it for the East coast, but there were some guys in Virginia, there were some guys in New Smyrna beach, but then in California you had Santa Cruz, you had Santa Barbara, you had Orange County, you had San Diego. And each of those pockets of surfers were pretty insular and they had their own board designs that fit the type of surfing they were doing, the waves they were riding. Um, the way they saw waves being ridden. And same thing with Hawaii, there'd be South Shore guys, there'd be North Shore guys, there was different board design and shapers that worked for each of those. Then you go to Australia, I remember going to Australia at 15 years old and meeting Jason Buttonshaw and he was riding these boards of this crazy tail rocker, but they were riding really hollow waves that were super fast. And that board design still, it actually still goes through to the lineage now with Mick Fanning and the Joel Parkinson and the stuff, but like, like mixed boards have tons of tail rocker, but it uses big fins to kind of offset the slowness from the, from the extra tail rocker. 
I think there's something really like magical about that. When I used to travel to Puerto Rico and Barbados as a kid, and they were riding different equipment. And I think it's good to have these separations of all that stuff because then you see how people's imaginations come up with these different designs, these different approaches, and and the waves kind of dictate that to some degree. The, their ex, their exposure to other people from around the world dictate that to some degree. Like the most exciting from, thing for me as a kid was when Matt Keckley would come home. He was my shaper and mentor. And he would come home from traveling around the world and he'd bring me these videos and I would just sit down and he'd have two, three, four hours of videos from Australia or South Africa or wherever he went on his video camera. And um, it may, I didn't get to see everything. It would just, he would shoot a heat or a, some, some guy walked, like Shane Heron walking down the beach with his single fin board, maybe not even surfing. He just showed me the board um, or some break they found where no one was surfing on the south coast of Sydney. And I, my, my imagination just ran wild with this stuff. And I think it's almost a better way for kids to grow up to be imagining it than being exposed to it all the time. Um, you, you, you formulate your own opinion, your own way to deal with that or, or learn it. Um, and so now I, I do worry about the future for where we're at. You know, everyone's really divided. There's, there's just so much, there's so much division and not seeing eye to eye between people in culture and, and uh, in society. So it's kind of, that's scary. For, I think that's a scary state of the world right now. Yes, it is. Yeah. But it's also that, I think what you're describing is sort of culture in, in general, but like that, that, that um, the shielding of everything, mm. you know, that, that sort of um, letting your imagination run wild through the very small thing that you are allowed to do yeah it's kind of how you end up with giants like kelly slater you know it's how you have heroes do you <laughs> ever think that like if you were born into this generation you might not might not be that guy you know yeah yeah Your whole life sure. i'm sure you did things yeah i world. i saw a lot of opening for me to be ahead of the curve in a lot of ways because of where everything was at and where i imagined it could be and um i got on the tour the first year and i i, I remember telling one of kind of one of my sort of early heroes. He was done with his pro surfing career, but he worked for Quick, uh, Quicksilver at the time. And he goes, it was my first year on tour and we were in Sydney and he said, oh, what do you think about the state of surfing? And um, he goes, it's really great, isn't it? Like, and I, I said, actually, I don't think anybody's surfing that great. And he goes, are you serious? And I go, yeah, I just actually don't think it's that good. And he was like, wow, that, I don't know if he thought I had a crazy ego. It wasn't my ego. It was just that I could see where surfing could be. And I felt like the equipment and the surfers, the, the way people were riding waves was, was archaic already. It was, it was like already antiquated, even though it was the, the best guys. <clears throat> because I, I was seeing where my friends were pushing it and we were much younger and I could see where it was gonna go. And now we're there, you know, now, I, so to answer your question, yeah, if I was born today, or if I was just say turning pro right now, I think it would be really, really, I'd be super hard pressed to do what I did. Um, it's just a different era, it's a different time. It's, you're seeing almost every year somebody else wins a world title. You know, no one's been able to really pull away. I thought Gabriel Medina was gonna do it. I thought John John Florence was gonna do it. Um, you know, Felipe looks like the guy right now in the waves that determine the world uh, title anyways at Trestles. Um, <clears throat> but I think it's harder now for someone to really stamp their authority and pull away than it was um, in the 90s and 2000s. Yeah, well, I'm sure we could go, we could do three more hours on this, but thank you, <laughs> uh, <laughs> appreciate you coming down here sure. um, to the Gulf Journal office on a weekend and doing this. It was no a lot of fun, thank you. Yeah, thanks man. Appreciate it.